गुड मॉर्निंग जी सी आई फैमिली हियर इन इंडिया एंड एन ऑफकोर्स अमी ओ फ्रॉम बांग्लादेश ज्वाइनिंग अस लवली टू सी ऑल योर स्माइलिंग फेसिस एंड दोज हु डोंट हैव वीडियोज नाइस टू सी योर नेम्स रिटन देर वेलकम टू आर वर्शिप सर्विसेस टूडे अगेन एंड वी हैव बिन रिमाइंडेड अबाउट टीचर्स डे uh so let me also take that opportunity that god bless all our teachers uh in various capacities either as you know in an institution or in the family as parents uh and various other ways that we bring teaching and i think it was david uh, de silva who reminded us in the chat box that jesus christ remains our greatest teacher what a privilege we have to have jesus christ as our teacher and today the holy spirit teaching us and leading us into all truth so uh having said that uh today i want to revisit a a topic a subject that many of us and all of us are very familiar with and it is as we would call it an important sacrament as some would like to term it or maybe you can call it an ordinance uh in the church and i'm obviously i'm talking about baptism and so i would want to spend a few moments today to discuss the symbolism or the spiritual significance of uh this ritual that we perform in the church and we regard as a sacrament or an ordinance now like i was mentioning all christians and all churches i i believe uh you know regard this as an ordinance and an as a practice in their fellowship um so i don't think there is any exception there all of them have various belief systems about this particular topic but as usual <laughs> uh many if not all have some kind of a divided view on it uh, some people regard it in a particular way which is not necessarily accepted by a few others uh some believe in immersion some believe in sprinkling some believe in adult baptism or baptism of believers some you know also have children child baptism infant baptism so you have where uh, the uh, the spectrum is wide in with regards to various beliefs now for some of you who have been attending our bible study we had gone through a lengthy discussion on this and uh uh you know some of this may be a repetition for you but nevertheless i feel there is a need for me to bring this uh, to your attention today you know i sometimes wonder why we become so divided in the church uh you know over these matters and i i know that some people are very careful in wanting to follow scripture and so the reason they have particular strong views about the subject of baptism is because they want to be very careful about what the scripture says and they want to follow as closely as possible to what the scripture says and i appreciate that and 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 all of you will remember that we in the church are also extremely uh you know careful and respectful of what scripture says but sometimes unfortunately there are others uh, who want to be controversial <laughs> and so they tend to you know bring in controversies all the time and i sincerely hope that you know even though we might have a different view from others we should not go into the practice of condemning and dividing and so just be respectful and let it uh let god finally you know bring clarity in all of this now most of you who are part of gci uh you all know that we have constantly 
looked at our doctrines, our belief systems, our statement of faith, we have constantly reviewed, checked, we have formed committees to look into how the scripture, you know, teaches many of these doctrines. And let me say that we are courageous enough to say that when we find something is not in alignment with the scriptures, we are willing to change. Because that is the, that is the process of growth. We are being told to grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus. So we constantly, continuously remain on that path of reviewing, checking, to see whether we are following the scriptures as closely as possible. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, we believe that in some of these matters, we don't have the final word. Nobody has the final word. And we may have to embrace a mystery with regards to some of these uh, you know, topics. I uh, like the song. I think it was Jessica who sang it for us in our worship uh, uh, session. He's still working on me. <laughs> uh, isn't it true that God continues to work on each one of us because we are growing. We are going through a growth process. He works in the church because the church is growing. And someday the church will arrive at a point where there will be no more blemish, no more spot or wrinkle that like we have been reminded by the apostle. So we are on that journey. And in this respect, I am reminded of what the apostle Paul tells the Corinthian church in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13. He says, now we have, now we see, but a dim reflection as in a mirror then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am known fully. So Paul himself was categorical over the fact that in some matters, we only know in part. We don't know the complete story or the complete picture. We cannot, you know, uh, you know dogmatically state certain things. And so in that respect, we continuously distinguish between core beliefs and peripheral beliefs. Core beliefs are something we cannot compromise on, like Jesus Christ being the son of God and the son of man. That's a core belief, fully God and fully man. But there are other, you know, uh, doctrines or beliefs that may be peripheral and we may not have the final word on that. But nevertheless, we do the best to remain faithful to the scriptures. And also we do our best to be faithful to what we know. If it is this much that we know, we try to be as faithful as possible. And as God leads us, as the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, we walk in step with the spirit. We continue to be led of the spirit so that we correct ourselves and continue to uh, be elucidated uh, to, to know and understand God's truth. So I would, I would put baptism under the peripheral perspective uh, because of various interpretations we can make from scripture with regards to baptism. It is uh, something which is not necessarily core, a, a core belief. Now, and I will hopefully explain that as we go along. So to give you some thoughts and some uh, perspectives on baptism, especially bringing you a spiritual significance of it, I'd like to read you our statement of faith uh, with regards to what we say, what GCI as a den uh, denomination, as a fellowship says. And let me put up on the screen so you can refer it as I read it for you. Uh, as you will see on the screen, that could be a title for my message today, The Spiritual Significance of Baptism. And uh, this is the statement that we have formulated with regards to 
the belief, our belief on baptism. Let me read for you. It says, the sacrament of baptism proclaims that we are saved by Christ alone and not through our own repentance and faith. It is a participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in which our old selves have been crucified and renounced in Christ. And we have been freed from the shackles of the past and given new being through his resurrection. Baptism proclaims the good news that Christ has made us his own and that it is only in him that our new life of faith and obedience merges. Grace communion baptizes by immersion. Okay, so that is how we have framed our statement of belief with regards to baptism. And you will notice that we have uh, captured the essence of what the scripture says. And we are trying our best not to deviate from the scriptures as much as we understand what the scriptures tell us. Okay, let me just uh, uh, take you through what or uh, unpack what that statement actually is telling us. So notice the statement begins by saying that we are saved by Christ. In other words, baptism doesn't save us. The ritual doesn't save us. You know, we are not saved by works, but by faith in Christ. So it is Christ who saves us. And we place our faith in Christ, not a ritual that we perform. That has to be made clear. That is our core belief in, in one sense, if you could call it core, right? Uh, why do we say that? Well, I mean, I think there are, uh, you know, in, uh, instances where some people are not able to be baptized. You know, I know of individuals who have physical conditions, bedridden. They are unable to be immersed for a, you know, a, a practice that we follow with regards to baptism. In that respect, can we say that even though they have placed their faith in Christ, that they won't be saved? Obviously not. And of course, many of you will remember the thief on the cross who looked to Jesus and placed his faith on him. Jesus obviously didn't say, now, why don't you just go and get baptized before I pronounce you saved? No, he immediately pronounced him saved. So what we understand here is the ritual doesn't save us. No ritual saves us. A ritual is only a, a symbolism that we have accepted Christ. It is Jesus Christ who saves us. Secondly, in uh, our statement of faith, it is symbolic. The practice of baptism, or you could say the ritual of baptism, is symbolic. It has a special meaning for us. The scriptures indicate that the ritual provides a picture or a, uh, a special meaning. And what is it? You could say it is a participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, we are participating with Christ for uh, a death that we have to experience. And it doesn't stop the, the resurrection that we experience. It shows, it pictures that we are wanting to, we are desirous of wanting to crucify our own selves. And that is very important. Baptism is telling us, I am I'm wanting to crucify my old self because my old self is sinful. And so we are immersing ourselves along with Jesus into a watery grave, into a death. Why? Because we are desirous of wanting to get rid of sinfulness. We know sin leads to death. And we need to be uh, released, redeemed from death. So that is a powerful picture of symbolism of baptism that we are participating in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Another symbolic meaning of it is that it is 
symbolic of freedom. You see, the statement tells us that once we participate in a ritual like this, we free ourselves and we mentally understand that we are being freed from the shackles of the past. In other words, we don't have to worry about the past, all the mistakes we have made. And each one of us will recognize that we have a past that needs forgiving, that needs to be changed. We need Jesus' blood to wash it clean. So it's a symbol of freedom, freedom from the past. And you could say the fact that we are not perfect today, it's even a freedom from present mistakes that we will make, shortcomings that we continue to struggle with. It reminds us that we are not perfect, but we continue to move forward in the spirit. So it's, a, it's symbolic of freedom. Okay. Uh, what else can we pick up from the, uh, from the uh, statement of belief? It is also symbolic of a new life and the resurrection. You know, the coming up out of the water is like a resurrection, right? It is, it is reminding us that we want to live a life now worthy of the resurrected life. A reminder that the ultimate freedom from imperfection is a reality. We recognize our imperfection. We go into the death of Jesus, but along with him, we are raised into a new life. Right. So our statement of belief with regards to baptism summarizes that we are participating in a death, we are being freed from the past, and we are now moving into a new life, which is symbolic of a resurrection. And that's the reason why in Romans chapter 6 and verse Three and four, which was read to us in the scripture reading. Uh, let, let me bring that back on the screen for you. I hope you can see it. It is reminding us that in verse three, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, you see, participating in the death of Christ, baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Verse 4 says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I hope that makes that clear for, uh, for us uh, with regards to a very powerful spiritual symbolism we see in the ritual. Okay, but let's not forget the ritual doesn't save us. It is Jesus Christ who saves us, saves us. We place our faith in Jesus, not in the ritual. Okay, let, let me just reiterate that. There are a few more thoughts that I would like to share with you with regards to how we should understand baptism. Uh, we also recognize that baptism, the ritual, is almost like a proclamation of the good news, the gospel, that Christ indeed has come and made us his own. Christ has received us into himself by being, by coming in the flesh. He has included us into his humanity. So when we get baptized, it's like the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel that Jesus Christ has received us. And all of humanity are now invited into him, right? There obviously is a response to that. Our response is to accept the invitation, you see? Because the invitation has come first from God. And that is why I believe, and uh, this is something that, you know, I've come to recognize more and more, that... Jesus was baptized for help, helping us to understand that he has received us, all of humanity, into himself. He has, in other words, taken humanity and 
gone into the water. As John was baptizing, he went into the water, but it is symbolic of all of humanity going into the water. Why do I say that? Because Jesus was not baptized for himself, was he? Did you, do you think he had any sins to repent of? Obviously not. He was perfect. So he was not being baptized for himself. But he was bap being baptized for all of us, for all of humanity. Just like his death. His death is for all of humanity. And we can claim that death in Christ our Lord. Right? Uh, Jesus is representing humanity in his death and in his baptism. So that is the reason why Jesus was baptized, not for himself, but for us. And so uh, when we get baptized in whatever way uh, we have been baptized in the past, uh, it's a sign that I want to belong to him. I am accepting Jesus and accepting his invitation and, and recognizing him as my Lord and my Savior. That's a very powerful thought, once again, to keep in mind as we understand baptism. Now, the statement also said that grace communion baptizes by immersion. Okay? Now, uh, that is the best we know. All right. Uh, the best we know from the practice in scripture with what Jesus did, we know that most of those baptisms seem to be done by immersion. So we want to be faithful to that particular practice. And it is our normal practice that we baptize a person that is old enough to know Christ. That is also a practice that we have embraced in GCI. Now, you may ask me, well, what is the age? What is the acceptable age? I'm sorry, but I won't be pulled into that controversy. All I'll say is baptize a person old enough to know Christ. All right. That is as much as I can say, because I don't have anywhere in scripture that says that age 18 is when you get baptized or age 15 or whatever. There is no age prescription in the scriptures. Right? Uh, and that's the reason why we say people who are old enough to get baptized. Now, we do provide counsel to those who want to make that commitment like I have done for a few in the church, including my own children uh, who have been baptized in our fellowship. Uh, we like to do that because we want, you know, someone old enough to recognize the symbolism and the spiritual significance of it. And we would like to do that. Now, uh, even as I talk about the practice of uh, you know, baptism through immersion through someone who's old enough to be baptized. Recently, we have been, we have been, I mean, to say forced to make, uh, or rather forced to see anew with regards to something that we never did in the past. Because some parents came to us, and this is in our fellowships in the US, the Philippines, in many other countries. Some parents came to us and said, uh, I want my child to be baptized, you know, age two, three, four. I want my child to be baptized. And then <laughs> we had a dilemma. What do we do now? <laughs> uh, do we not respect the faith that a parent is showing on with regards to baptizing their child? Now, we do say that, and we continue to hold the practice of uh, uh, blessing the child, right? We follow the practice what Jesus Christ, uh, you know, followed by inviting little children. I think he laid hands on them. He probably carried some. He blessed them. But what do we do if a parent comes and says, well, I want my child to be baptized. I Yes, certainly a blessing, but 
baptized. Now this, uh, you know, is something that we have to do a careful study of. And through a study that uh, our uh, ministers and our theologians have gone into, we have come to the following conclusion. And uh, follow with me carefully as we go through this, uh, you know, this what how we have concluded. What is the GCI position on child baptism? First and foremost, we believe that the children of all believing parents are holy. We believe that the children of all believing parents are holy. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. It says, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. The children of believing parents, even if it is one parent, are holy. So we hold that position in GCI that children of believing parents are holy. Okay, so that is one thought that we have uh, concluded with. Secondly, children are included in the promise of the new covenant. Children are included in the promise of the new covenant. And once again, let me read you Acts chapter 2, very familiar verse for all of us. Verse 38 says, Peter replied, Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children. And for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It is very clear in scripture that children are included in the new covenant, you know, promise. Uh, that they are part of the household of God. They are part of the family of God, right? And so uh, that is an important Conclusion we have come to make through our study. Next, as I said a little earlier, in Jesus, in Jesus' baptism, all of humanity is included. Don't forget. When you say all of humanity, it includes children. Right? So we believe in one sense that child, whichever child is already baptized in Jesus. Because Jesus baptized, was baptized for all humanity. You know? Uh, so what, I mean, if, if we are going against that, if we say, no, 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 that's not what it means, then what would happen to a child if Jesus should return tonight? I think about my two-year-old grandchild, right? And his name is Benjamin Daniel. I like it very much. <laughs> Uh, uh, what happens to him if Jesus returns tonight? Am I, I haven't even seen him because of the pandemic. Man, I'd love to, I'd like to embrace him. You mean to say he's, he's just because he's a child, he's not included? So we have concluded that in Jesus, every child is baptized. So here is our GCI position. It is our belief that there is not enough reason to condemn child baptism. Unfortunately, which we did in the past. There is not, mark my words carefully, there is not uh, enough reason in the scriptures to condemn child baptism. But, GCI does not insist, insist on child baptism. But on the other hand, to honor a parent's faith and to celebrate Christ's commitment to all, including children, in his baptism, we will baptize little children if the parents want it that way. 
right? If the parents wanted that, we have no biblical reason to refuse that. Now, if we have a conscience problem, that's different. We do not insist on it, but we will not refuse it. Uh, the, uh, the following quotation from a theologian may be helpful. And uh, it goes like this. It is uh, by Daniel Miglorat. He says, while the practice of infant baptism is not absolutely necessary in the life of the church, it may be permissible. It may be permissible. And I'd like to read you another quotation from a very respected theologian. His name is James Torrance. Uh, some of you might have heard of that name, J uh, Torrance, the Torrance brothers. Uh, his quotation, let me just read, bring that up on the screen. This is what James Torrance, who is a Trinitarian theologian, says. He says the following. In the practice of infant baptism, we believe that in faith, we are doing something for the child long before the child comes to faith in acknowledgement of what Christ did for all of us 1900 years before we were born. But in faith, we pray that Christ in his faithfulness and in his own time will bring this child to personal faith. The efficacy of baptism is not in the right or in the water but in the faithfulness of Christ. That is the uh, position of GCI. And uh, the reason I wanted to speak on this is so that we are growing in our faith. There are practices we didn't have in the past. There are practices that we allow now. It is because we believe the Holy Spirit is leading us. Now, if we are wrong, we are willing to change. If the Holy Spirit convinces us that, oh, this is not necessarily correct, then we are willing to change. We want to be honest to the scriptures. And I believe, and we believe in GCI, that we cannot be honest by saying that child baptism should be condemned like we unfortunately did. And the greatest tragedy of the Christian church is to become divisive over unnecessary things. Jesus Christ doesn't like division, brethren. We shouldn't be dividing over these matters. We should allow people to believe as much as God has revealed to them. We must respect them. Now, that doesn't mean to say we should accept heresy. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we should accept all kinds of devilish thinking. No. But when there is genuine doubt, when we need genuine clarification, we must be careful that we don't go condemning people unnecessarily and unfortunately dividing churches. That is the work of the devil. Division, divisiveness is an inspiration of, the, of Satan the devil and not of Jesus Christ and not of the Holy Spirit. So brother, in closing, let us not lose the greater meaning of baptism. All right, and let me lead you one final verse uh, in the scriptures. Uh, I'll just put that again on the screen. I want to finish reading Matthew 28 verse 19. It says, therefore, and this is what Jesus, uh, you know, it, call, it is called the Great Commission. This is what he left for the church. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Remember, baptism is a symbol of being included in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What greater joy can we have that Jesus himself through his baptism is now in, including us into the very Godhead, Father, Son, 
Holy Spirit into the very name, into the very, you know, communion of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What a wonderful promise we have, brethren. We are going to be included in the life and in the communion of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, our triune God. May God bless you and give you uh, the wisdom to continue to grow with us. And you are with GCI, and GCI is a dynamic church, a church that is moving ahead along with the Holy Spirit. God bless you.